right, good morning, church. Great to be with you here today. I'm AJ. I'm the campus pastor here at Renewal Church in the Highlands. And it is awesome to be together as we can continue our series in Matthew. If you want to get to Matthew 9, 35, we're going to spend some time there uh, in Matthew 9 and 10 this morning. Um, do you guys notice my beautiful my wife Megan was doing the, uh, the welcome and everything? You guys notice she kept saying, Pastor AJ? It's like she didn't want to claim me as, as her husband. Um, I make her call, call me Pastor AJ even at home, so... Uh, but no, um, you know what, as we dig in here today, uh, you know, it's funny, Megan and I used to, um, we first met as doing youth ministry at neighboring churches, and, uh, you know, we, we, as we took our youth groups to different places and eventually got married and, and still continued to uh, be engaged in youth ministry, I was thinking one of the, the fun things that we did one time is when, when we did a mission trip here to Colorado, we did a mission trip to Cortez, uh, which is a very impoverished uh, area of Colorado, and on our way back, we did not realize that uh, Table Mesa was on the way back. Um, and, you know, so well, we're geographically challenged, apparently, but, um, but we're like, Table Mesa is, is amazing. You always see it on the cover of sort of natural history books and, and things like that in the United States. And we're like, let's take the kids, uh, the youth group kids, the kids, the high schoolers, uh, you know, let's take them to Table Mesa. The church will foot the bill. This is like an opportunity we can't pass up. And so we're like, we're going, all right? And we, we head on over. Uh, this is, uh, of course, very kind of southwest corner of the state. And um, Table Mesa, if you don't know, is this like ancient Native American cliff dwellings. They're sort of built right into the cliffside. It's like there's this really cool open cave. And, um, you know, they have all of these houses built right in there, and they've been standing for like thousands of years at this point, you know, and uh, just incredible. And so, you know, Megan and I were like, you get kind of getting to walk through Table Mesa and walk through the ruins and everything and kind of experience everything that's there. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. I'm so glad that we went. And, and you know, of course, we had youth group kids that are just like, what? Oh, you know, and you're like, enough with the, the texting machine, all right? Um, you got to look and see what, you, what is all around you. And, and it, as we think about today's passage, it just makes me think of, do you ever, have you ever had an experience where someone said you're going, and you, you dreaded, and you did not want to go, and you didn't see the value in going, but then you went, and it was awesome, Anyone have that happen to you in life, right? Uh, you know, that sometimes we don't always see the value up front in uh, whatever that person said that we we're going to do. But through the act of going and, and experiencing, uh, suddenly we understand that there's something there. In today's text, Jesus calls us to be sent, to go to get out from here and move over to there with purpose. And sometimes we forget that we're supposed to be sent people. Sometimes we drag our feet on being sent people. But Jesus reminds us of the value of not just for others, but ourselves when we take that first step on the journey. And so today, let's walk through this passage that we just saw on video a minute ago. This is Matthew 9, uh, 35, and then it jumps into chapter 10. Uh, but they're in Galilee, the, the area around the Sea of Galilee in Israel. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages there, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. Uh, in verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And so if you've ever, back up one, please. If you ever wondered, like, kind of how God looks at you. Sometimes in media, we have different views of who God is, right? Maybe you picture the Monty Python God that's just kind of like up there in the clouds yelling at people, right? Or maybe it's a God that's throwing lightning bolts or buddy Jesus, right, or whoever. Uh, but here we see God's disposition and posture toward us is one of compassion. When he sees people who are helpless, when he sees people who are leaderless, when he sees people who are shepherdless, he, his heart goes out toward us uh, and he has empathy for us uh, because he desires that his people be led. 
How can they go unless they are led, right? And then he says this. He says in verse 37, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Right now in our country, we actually have a laborer shortage. You may have not noticed as you've been out and about, it seems like just about everywhere has help wanted signs, right? Uh, is hiring for some position or other. Maybe your favorite fast food joint, the, the dining room has been closed or the Starbucks dining room has been closed uh, and they're just operating in drive through only mode. Uh, that for some reason the pandemic has affected uh, our the number of workers there are right now. And the workers that are in the workforce, it's been shown that they're more mobile than ever. They're switching jobs, they're quitting jobs, they're taking jobs. And so there's some, some crazy stuff going on in the American workforce right now. And there is a worker shortage. Not enough people to fill the positions, right? So the, uh, you know, the restaurants are full, the cheeseburgers are in the restaurant, but the laborers to work that are few. Um, Jesus... He says, he looks out at the crowd of people that's following him around Galilee, and he imagines them like heads of grain to be picked, uh, as people um, who God cares about deeply, who wants to be in his Father's kingdom, uh, as people um, who need to be brought in, just as a harvest is brought in. And he says, the harvest is plentiful. Look, you can see it with your eyes. Look at the people out there. If we were to look in our city, we see the massive population growth of Denver. We look around, there's people everywhere. The harvest is plentiful. The workers are few, Jesus says. So pray to the Lord that he will send out workers into his harvest field. Um, it's hard to pray that prayer without imagining going, maybe I should do something about that. Uh, Jesus, it's interesting, he doesn't say, hey, you guys go out, you're going to be my harvest workers, uh, but it, rather he wants them to process through it in prayer. He wants us to engage in prayer, and as they pray that prayer of God send out workers in the field, how can they not but increase in willingness to go about that themselves? And the same is true of us, right? Uh, but Jesus, he plants that seed in them, and then he sort of harvests it uh, in the next verse. It says he calls them, his 12 disciples, right? Their willingness had been increased in prayer and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Uh, he gives them authority to do that which he does. When we first picked up with this passage in verse 35, what was Jesus doing? He was going throughout the countryside. He was healing every disease and every affliction and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And that's what he empowers his apostles, his disciples, to do. To do the things that he has been doing. To walk in his footsteps and to take up his work as his sort of ambassadors, right? And he empowers them with the power of the Spirit to actually do these amazing, sometimes miraculous things. Um, and the miracles that they do our affirmation of the one who sends them, Jesus, and the power that he has, and also affirmation of the message that they proclaim, right? If I just came and proclaimed, uh, hey, there's a million bucks in a cardboard box down the street, you just got to go grab it, what would you say? Not likely, right? But if I am walking down the sidewalk and I've got about 10,000 bucks in cash, in my hands, and I say there's a million bucks in a box down the sidewalk, you just got to go grab it, then what are you going to think? There might be something here, right? Uh, the miracles, uh, what's go coming along with the message, actually, um, you know, proclaim that it is efficacious, that it's actually happening, right? Um, and as he sends them, he gathers his 12 apostles, and he names them here. He says, uh, first there's Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. They're known as the Sons of Thunder, which that's like the coolest like, nickname ever, all right? I'm just going to say that. Um, Philip and Bartholomew, we think Bartholomew may, may be another name for Nathan, uh, or Nathaniel, excuse me. Uh, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. We've got James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus. We've got Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, uh, who betrayed him. Um, and so these are, are the names of the apostles that he gathers, right? It's hardly a list of, of King David's mighty men, right? Um, it's a list of ordinary people um, 
people who are not particularly theologically well-versed. It's a list of people who have ordinary professions. Most of them were fishermen, from what we can tell. Um, it's, it's hardly like the A-team that you would assemble. And yet, God does not call the equipped, but he equips the called. Uh, this is proof of it, right? That when he gathers his apostles, his ambassadors together, he gathers ordinary people because he wants to show you and me our value and worth. And it's not in how skilled you may or may not be at this point or when you were called by Jesus, uh, because when he calls, he then equips. He loves to build people up. Uh, he doesn't, you know, if, if we come with a high view of ourselves to start with and, and whatever, then he has to break us down first, right? But Jesus loves to start where we are. And oftentimes, the weaker we are, the greater that he can work in us to show us his power at work. And so yeah, he chooses us from whatever we are, uh, whatever you view of yourself, God chooses you. And if your view of yourself is pretty low, think about this, that the God of the universe chooses you uh, because he made you, he created you in his image. He loves you. He will stop at nothing to win you back. And he has chosen you through the cross through Jesus and through him crucified, he chooses us and calls us by name. That when Jesus is dying for the sins of the world, yours and mine included, and for our guilt and shame and everything we've done that have dishonored one another and God, Jesus goes to the cross that that might be paid for. And as he sheds his blood, it's our names that are on his mind. As he dies and rises again, he does so so that we too might die to sin, but then rise again in new life. Um, he says, I'm not done with you. I'm not giving up on you, not even close. Instead, he says, I choose you. As imperfect as you are, as sinful as you are, maybe even as normal as you are, as ordinary as you are or whatever, um, you know, like the, the 12 apostles, he actually says, you're special to me. You are treasured and valuable to me. Uh, and if today you walked in with a low self-image, you're going to have to correct that because Jesus has a pretty high image of who he's created you to be. Uh, and generally, we say if Jesus thinks it, if he believes it, if he teaches it, we should probably get with it. Am I right? Um, and so today, God, know that he, he chooses you to be his apostles. Um, he wants your name out there just like theirs as someone who now bears his image and bears his gospel to the rest of the world. And there's some great news in this. Check this out here. Look at the punctuation. I highlighted it for you. These are semicolons indicating pairs, right? It's Peter and Andrew, James and John, sons of thunder, uh, Philip and Bartholomew, right? They're all going out in pairs. Nobody is alone uh, because Jesus recognizes our need to do ministry and do life together, right? And if we are doing life alone, we are missing out on an incredible benefit uh, of what we can get out of partnership in the gospel with others, community with others. Uh, when you send out people two by two, think of all the things that come from that, right? We can support one another. Um, we can encourage one another. We can challenge one another and, and go, uh, you know, here's some, some issues you really have, uh, right, uh, in a kind and loving way, right? There's a lot of things that we can do two by two. If we go out one at a time, there's no help. Um, we are lonely. We cannot see our blind spots. Going out two by two is great, and it makes us that's more, much more feeling fulfilled and effective on the journey of life and of going where the Lord sends us to go. And so he does not send us alone, but calls us to community, right? He calls you to either this church community or another church community, uh, to a small group, whatever it is, to engage with others in the mission of God. I say all the time that here at Renewal Church, it's all about following Jesus on mission together. Uh, and so if you're going it alone, if there's a part of that that's, that's your choosing, I encourage you to rethink that, right? Um, you know, if you're within geographic range of, of our community, you're watching it on the stream, uh, I encourage you to make sure that you're getting here in the flesh and the blood to interact with people because it's different when we do, uh, when we share our journey with others. Jesus wants us to go out as partners in the gospel, and that's what we're all about here. Now, um, why include Judas Iscariot? First off, 
why, why do half of the disciples have the same name? I don't know. We're going to have to ask God that uh, at some point, right? Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's so that we confuse them and, and uh, none of them can become too, too big and mighty. I don't know. Um, but why Judas Iscariot? Why is the betrayer in the list? If you are almighty God and you know in advance that this guy is going to betray you to death, would you not just boot him out from day one, right? Why keep him in the mix? Because God never gives up on people. And his foreknowledge, just because he knows it's going to happen, uh, doesn't mean that he, he just says, well, well, I guess I'm not trying with this person. On the contrary, he is the sower that scatters seed everywhere, even the unlikely places for it to grow. He is the one who loves us, even Judas, and wants to love and prove faithful uh, to what God has given him. Uh, that we have a God who ultimately doesn't look at people as too far gone, as too far from his grace, but says that's a person created in God's image, uh, and so that's a valuable person, and Judas is included. Pretty crazy, right? He even, he even winds up in the upper room, uh, maybe not for the Last Supper part of it, but for the washing of the feet part. Yeah, crazy. Um, now, the word to describe these men is apostles, right? Uh, the Greek word in this passage, uh, you know, uh, sort of declended is apostolon. It means messenger uh, or envoy or sent one, right? It's these ordinary people have been given an extraordinary sort of designation as Jesus' primary emissaries to take the good news out. And these people who are, were leading unremarkable lives before Jesus after Jesus, are called and equipped to go out and to spread the good news and to do it in a profound way. These men would go on to write the New Testament. Uh, many of them would write letters that would be included in the New Testament. Uh, many of them would be martyred. In fact, all, all of them except for one of them would die for their faith prematurely, uh, would put it all on the line for Jesus, right? Um, that this is a, a tremendous group after they encounter Jesus. This is an amazing group of faith after they have met the Lord of the universe through Jesus and been chosen by him. Uh, and God also selects our name as well and empowers us to go and to be his disciples, to be his hands and feet. I love this Carrie and Newhoff quote uh, or tweet. The idea that God would use you, you and me is pretty amazing. He had other idea, uh, options. Uh, I always thought that was kind of funny. Um, but truly, he wants us. There's something beautiful in getting us to take the news to others, to getting people who have been broken, who have been healed, or are on the path and journey of healing through the gospel, and getting them to bear witness to that with others. Uh, there's something beautiful in that. And so Jesus, having appointed his 12, uh, sends them out. He sends them and says, go, 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 right? He, he appoints them to go out and take his good news uh, to other people, right? He says, go, uh, and uh, we'll come back to this part, but he says, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in doing this, he sort of invokes another kingdom theme. In going through this Kingdom Come series, we've been exploring what are some of the, the kingdom themes that Matthew brings out of Jesus' ministry. And some of those that we've talked about are fulfillment of God's word, inclusion of outsiders, uh, the coming judgment. And today, we focus on being sent on mission. This is a theme that Matthew continues to come back to. It's a core part of our identity as disciples of Jesus is being sent out to go and accomplish his purposes. Um, you know, that we're not called to, to stay put or to make our faith just a private affair, but it is an affair that we are about in community and for community. And what's really cool, too, is in the, this passage we see that he sends these disciples out before they're fully ready, we would say. He sends them out to grow uh, as they go, uh, and to go as they grow, uh, to sort of learn on the job, almost like trade school. Um, when I think about, you know, myself in my adult life, I've really latched on to working on cars. I didn't learn it at a younger age, but I've really enjoyed kind of getting to know it uh, as an adult. Now, as I, as I work on cars, do you think I just leap in and start wrenching on stuff without having any idea what I'm doing? Okay, maybe sometimes, but no, no, uh, don't do that, right? Um, do you think I spend 100% of my time enjoying cars by looking at them on the internet, watching YouTube videos, and reading manuals? No. You get hands-on with the real thing. Um, 
and you grow as you grow, uh, as you go, uh, frankly, and you'll learn a lot through doing. Um, and likewise, our faith is called to be that sort of thing. That a lot of times we kind of go, I need to learn all the stuff, and then I can do. Well, we, you wouldn't do that, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't do that with cars. Um, you, that would create a false sense of knowledge because you've never put hands on the real thing, right? And likewise with our faith, when we have a faith that's all about, I'm going to learn before I do, uh, then there, it becomes a false academic exercise. It's, it's not really discipleship, right? That God calls us to grow as we go and to sort of learn on the job, right? And that requires both going and continuing to stay anchored to Jesus and his word and in prayer, like he calls his disciples to pray at the beginning, like all those things happening simultaneously. And there's something about that that's a really beautiful process because we can continue to do and then to come back and to debrief, to coach those skills up again, and then to do again, and to come back and, and debrief and coach and do again. By the way, that's how you do discipleship, right? You have people around you that need to grow in their relationship with Jesus. That's a pretty easy thing to do with people is, hey, can we establish some sort of regular meeting where we, you know, talk about how it's been going. We debrief how it's been going in the faith, and then we get back into God's Word in prayer. We coach up, uh, you know, what disciples do, and then we touch base on it again. That's an easy way to disciple others, right? Um, that is what it's all about, is God going, you're going to grow as you go. Um, and in fact, you, you might not be, you know, uh, growing if you're not going. In Philemon 1.6, it says, as you share the faith you have in common with others, I pray that you may come to have a complete knowledge of every blessing that we have in Jesus, right? It's in as you share you actually understand the gospel more through sharing the gospel and through demonstrating the gospel through your hands and feet. Uh, you actually understand what Jesus is up to more when we engage in the work that Jesus has called us to do, right? And like I said, if we are not going out, I would argue we are not growing. Check out this discipleship wheel. We talk about this in our Next Steps class, which is a class for those who are interested in learning more about what it means to follow Jesus as a member of the Renewal community. And you've probably all seen this wheel if you've been through that class. It kind of talks about, you know, what, as we start a life of faith, it's sort of a spiritual imprint, and then, you know, childhood and young adulthood, and then parenthood where we're mentoring others. Um, what I think is really, really fascinating in the wheel is at a certain point, if we are not going if we are not serving others, then we can't grow. Because there's this big divider here. Spiritual childhood is, is typified by or, or is exemplified by us engaging with God, learning about God in new ways, having a hunger for, for what God is up to in our lives. And that's a really great thing, right? Um, and it's meant to lead to equipping for ministry and doing, right? But, you know, we can't grow into a spiritual young adult unless we start to make our faith more than just a, a me and God thing, but a thing that I live out, right? Um, it's, it's something where um, at a certain point uh, we, we must do or else there's a divider that we are putting in place. This is why we often talk about serving in and serving out in our community. Our heart is that we, we own serving in, which is to help make this experience on Sunday morning uh, an experience where people can connect with Jesus, and, and we do that through serving on volunteer teams. Our our pre-pandemic numbers, we had 90% of our community was engaged in a volunteer team. Uh, we're currently at about 70 cent, 70%. We'd like to get back to that 90% again, and we actually think it's best for people to engage in serving. And so uh, if you're not currently serving, come talk to me. I'd love to get you plugged in. Um, and you can test me on this one and see if you don't have more joy after you're plugged in, all right? Uh, you're crazy if you think you won't. Um, but we also serve out, that we desire to be a community in which we serve uh, our posture is to have compassion on those outside of these walls, outside of what we do on Sunday morning. Uh, and so we desire to be a community in which we're finding ways to bless our neighbors and to bless our city, uh, whether that's by ourselves or with our life groups or as a big church event. Uh, that's something we want to be about. Now, I want to point out this thing that we skipped earlier, where Jesus tells his disciples, don't go to the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, and enter, enter no town of the Samaritans, uh, which is for the, the people who have mixed religious belief, right? What's going on here, right? Why is Jesus telling them not to take the gospel to a certain place that seems really counter Jesus, right? Um, God has always wanted the Jews uh, to be a people that he raises up to tell other people the good news. 
Throughout the Old Testament, this is a thread. He, he says he wants to make them a kingdom of priests, a, you know, to, to go out and be a holy priesthood that's going to share the good news. Priests connect people to Jesus, right? And that's what he wants them to be. Even in the New Testament, he calls us to be uh, a holy priesthood, right? To connect people to God, their Father. Uh, and so God wants, when, when he comes in his, his incarnate ministry, uh, when Jesus comes, he wants to go, hey, Jewish people that I've been raising up to tell the world about me, uh, I'm here, I'm, I'm connecting with you guys so that now we can go tell everybody, right? And he wants to enlist them in that process uh, and to do that first. And many of them say yes, and many of them say no, right? Uh, but ultimately, his goal is that the Jews will help him in taking the good news to the Samaritans and Gentiles and to the ends of the earth. Now, for us, who are the recipients of that good work of everyone sharing their faith throughout thousands of, of years, right? We do not have to go far to share our faith or to find people who need uh, us to proclaim the gospel in word and in deed. Um, if you have kids, your kids need to hear you preach the gospel to them. My kids need to hear my kid, me preach the gospel to them. Uh, that God, I believe, wants you and I to be the pastors of our households, right? Um, your spouse needs the gospel preached to them. Um, that your spouse needs you to set that time to pray together, uh, to be going through God's word together, to engage in spirituality together, right? Um, your literal, actual, next door neighbors need you to be a neighbor to them. Um, we talk about this a lot in our community, but so often we kind of go, God's called us to love our neighbor. That kind of just means everybody, right? And so we need to go love our neighbors. And, and, and that just means sometimes we just boil that down to being nice to people, right? Uh, and we're just kind of neighboring. We're kind of rocking it. Um, God actually doesn't want us to forget also the literal definition of neighboring, which is your literal, actual, next-door neighbors, the people you live right next to. God has given you an opportunity to bless them and to be in a relationship with them uh, and wants them to encounter Jesus through encountering you, right? And God wants us to bless our figurative neighbors, uh, you know, the ones who we bump up around, uh, bump up against in, in our workplace and out in the community and so forth, right? Uh, we don't have to go far to find people that need the demonstration of the gospel and what it looks like um, through what you do and the verbalization of the gospel through what we speak, right? Um, and so the question today that we all have to ask is, who is God calling me to? And who is God calling me to invite in? Uh, both of these work, right? Uh, that God desires for us to encounter people, um, to open up our lives uh, and engage with people, uh, to open up our life groups, uh, to engage people in joining us in worship so that we can together proclaim what God is up to uh, and people can begin to learn more about what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, and the reality is God is calling us, if we think in our minds right now, I bet you there's somebody he is putting in, or there's a family, or there's someone that he's putting in your mind that he is calling us to relate with on a deeper level, uh, to be more invitational with, to serve to a greater extent, um, uh, and so that they hear the message that he brings, which is the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Right? This is the message that he brings in this passage. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he tells them to heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out the demons. Now, er, er, what? Raise the dead? That seems pretty, pretty crazy, right? In all the, the talk in this passage prior to this point, uh, Jesus has healed every disease and affliction. And then he called them to go out and he gave them power to heal every disease and every affliction. And now you're like, we're like, I guess he really meant every disease and affliction, right? You're telling him to, people to raise the dead? Um, there are stories in Scripture of Jesus doing it. Um, no stories that we know of of his disciples doing it. But I have a hard time believing he told them to do it uh, if it wasn't actually a part of their ministry. Uh, now, um, oftentimes, you know, just because we read about the, the disciples doing this doesn't necessarily mean uh, that this is something were to be about now. I believe that miracles do still happen. Um, but, you know, sometimes, uh, especially in our country, for whatever reason, we don't see this stuff as much. Uh, oftentimes, what God, we know God is calling us to 100% of the time is to heal those who are spiritually uh, dead, to raise these spiritual dead through the power of the gospel 
living in us through what we speak and what we do, and to not be afraid of what we say, right? Um, just a few verses further into Matthew 10, Jesus reminds him, he says, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not, who, uh, not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Uh, this is what prayer does. This is what time in communion with God does, is it, it allows God, it opens up our life for God to work through us uh, and in us for his purposes and for people when they meet us to really be encountering God uh, because we're in attuned and in step with the Spirit. That's what God desires for us. One thing that we do here at Renewal in order to make sure that we're encountering people um, so that we can love people is the 3 to one challenge. Um, so every week we encourage people to get in three conversations with people you don't know, learn at least two names, make at least one more meaningful connection. And this is, the numbers don't matter so much. What matters is this idea of we're being called to love other people. Uh, it's kind of hard to love people that you don't know exist. And so we really want to honor people by doing this, this 3 to one challenge together uh, and expecting God to work in the midst of that. And when God opens up avenues for us to serve people with the gospel or speak the gospel or invite people to worship or whatever it happens to be, um, we honor that space that God creates in a number of different ways. There's a, a book called God's Space uh, that actually proposes these, these ways that we honor when God opens up opportunities with people to, to sort of be gospel people, um, you know, to suspend any judgment we have of people, right? Uh, that's not our business. Uh, to, to listen, to understand people with whatever they have going on, to have compassion with people, um, to accept people uh, 100% doesn't mean we, we endorse everything that they do or they're about. Um, that we notice and wonder how God is up uh, to stuff in their life. We ask permission before sharing or praying for folks, right? And then we beware of any language that may not be shared language that may be more divisive. Um, but this is how we honor and lean into space that God may create with people around us uh, who need to hear the gospel, right? Um, you know, we don't ever want to reduce people to numbers, and we don't want to have an agenda with people other than this. The agenda I have with you is to love you, um, plain and simple. And that means that these are, these are some of the ways that I can do that. Um, and that's how we love people. So anyway, that's a great book by Doug Pollock. I encourage you to read the whole thing if you're interested. Um, but Jesus, in our passage today, he's, he reminds the, the disciples as they go out, he says, you received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey, or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. I love in the video that we watched earlier, you could see Peter just take his bag off. As, as Jesus was saying all this, he's like, what bag? Um, but I, I love that this is an example of, of us needing to check our motives. In this instance, God wants to remind his apostles, his disciples, um, not to profit off of what they're about to do, right? Not to get rich through sort of selling miracles or anything like that. Um, and to not to kind of make it about them, but just to, to make it about what they can do for others, to check their motives. A lot of times we think, uh, if I'm going to do something, there has to be something in it for me, right? Uh, at least maybe it has to be enjoyable. I have to enjoy it. There has to be some benefit, uh, emotional benefit for me. Uh, sometimes the stuff, guys, that God calls us to, there's no benefit to you and me, and it makes our lives a lot harder, and God still calls us to it um, because that's what he's modeled for you and for me. And so he says, check your motives, and he says, trust me on this one, right? Uh, he, he, he sets up this trust exercise with his disciples in this passage, and he says, don't take anything with you, and just trust me that along the way, even as you live selflessly and toward others, I'll take care of your basic needs. Now, interestingly, in Luke 22, uh, when he's telling the disciples um, about their work that they're to go do, he tells them to take a bag, and to take money, uh, and to, even to take a sword, right? And so we've got to be careful how much you draw out of just one passage sometimes without looking at the whole broader scope of Scripture. Um, the trust exercise he sets up here, uh, why does he set it up differently later on for them and tell them to take stuff with them? I'm not entirely sure, but I think it has something to do with this. In Jesus' ministry, it's kind of divided in three. Uh, so there's the year of inauguration, first year of his ministry, where it's kind of, you've seen it get started up. There's a year where he's really popular, 
And he's got all these throngs of people uh, crowded around him, and there's lots of uh, really large, high, big-scale miracles. Um, and then there's a third year that's a year of opposition, right, which is the year in which Luke 22 takes place. And I believe that the instructions are different because the situation is different. Um, Jesus no, has, no longer has to simulate hardship for his disciples uh, to create a trust exercise. Uh, the world's going to do that for him, right? And the world's going to do that for you and me, for us. But we have to trust God all the same. Uh, and in fact, sometimes we, we're going to trust God even more, right? Um, that God wants us, wants the best for us, uh, and he wants the best for others. And that means that he sends us out. And it, it isn't always easy, but it is always easy beneficial is always worthwhile. And as he kind of wraps it up here, he says, as you enter the house, greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Uh, and, and kind of what he's reminding them here, what he's effectively saying is what he's going to say a little bit more plainly later on in the chapter, whoever receives you, receives me. Uh, and so, you know, if it's a person of peace who receives you and is going to listen to you. That's great. Um, if not, that's a problem, right? And so we, we can even turn this into a kind of a prayer. Sorry, uh, back one. Um, that whoever receives you receives me. We can pray this. God, God, may whoever encounters me see you working through me, see you speaking through me. May that be so, right? May, may my words and actions uh, be so filled with salt and with light that people can't help but, but see there's something different and see God working through us and be curious about that, right? And, and it's really important, um, you know, that, th I mean, what we're talking about is high stakes here, right? Because whoever does not receive us doesn't receive Jesus. He kind of talks about here, if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. That's harsh, right? Sodom and Gomorrah were judged harshly for their disobedience. And if you guys remember when you watched the video a second ago, um, who was Jesus looking at when he said those words? He was looking at Judas, right? That made it pretty intense. For me, uh, the, you know, who knows if Jesus did that in real life, but how they portrayed it, um, you recognize that what Jesus is talking about here is not being vindictive uh, or anything like that, but that the, these are high stakes, right? People's eternities are at stake here, right? Receiving Jesus means receiving abundant life to the full now and for eternity, right? And if people reject Jesus or don't hear about Jesus, uh, if we don't have the urgency to take the message to them, right, um, this is a big deal. Uh, we should have an, a sense of urgency and a sense of being willing to sacrifice our own comfort because the stakes for others could not be higher, right? Um, and sometimes we go, okay, yeah, Jesus called the apostles to do that. They were apostles, right? And they had been commissioned with this extra power or special power to do all the miracles that they were doing. Uh, you know, I, I'm just, just me, just a normal disciple, right? Um, but don't talk yourself out of it. Don't rationalize out of it. And I encourage you, don't, don't misinterpret Ephesians 4.11, which says God created some to be teachers and prophets and evangelists and so forth and apostles, right? Uh, God calls every Christian to be a gospel sharer and bearer. And God is not asking you or me to do anything that he hasn't done already. Good leaders, you know, they always ask people, they're never willing to say, you should do this if they're not willing to do it themselves, right? And Jesus demonstrates that 100% in going to the cross for you and me. He demonstrates that he will put his life on the line for us because he loves us uh, his, he is the one who created us. Uh, he loves us with a, an incredible passion, a love that we can't fathom, that can't be surpassed, that can't be diminished by our own images of who we think we are even, right? Uh, but he does it for us. He chooses us by grace, right? And he asks us to be gospel bearers just as he was, to go and do what he did for you and for me. The victory of the cross is already the one we have to articulate and demonstrate right? Um, and to simply be willing as disciples of Jesus to follow where he goes. Um, go, 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 be sent people. At one point when, uh, when books first came out for, for phones, 
Uh, you know, I remember when like iBooks first came out and they had a bunch of freebies on there, like Winnie the Pooh and whatnot, whatever, whatever. Like one of the freebies that they had on there was The Art of War. And I read it. And uh, so now I'm very prepared. So watch yourselves, people. Um, no, but I, I read it. And it's really fascinating. Um, you know, it kind of talked about when war is declared, you do not wait for clarity, you do not wait for orders, you do not wait for supplies, you immediately mobilize your unit, you cross the border, and you attack your enemy. Um, or, what do you guys think? When the U.S. Coast Guard gets a, a mayday call for help, do they wait for better weather? Do they wait for it to not be nighttime? They go right away. Lives are at stake, right? Um, who is someone that God is calling you and me to be sent to today? As you think in your mind, I'll, I'll bet that person's already come to mind. That family's already come to mind. Uh, that, that person's already come to mind. This week, can we be a, a person who sends the text, who gives the invite. By this time next week, will that person uh, know that they are loved by you? Will they have been in your home? Will they maybe even be sitting right here next week? Because if, I mean, if we are not about reaching people and changing hearts and lives for eternity, what are we about as a church community? If we're not giving people what God has given us out of the joy of the gospel, what are we about, right? Uh, and I encourage us over this next week, not out of, out of this sense of like, oh, Will God love me if I don't do this? Or uh, am I not going to be a good Christian or whatever? But to go, you know what? God has appointed you and chosen you by name and sent us all out as his disciples on mission for him to be divinely created difference makers for your kids, for your spouse, uh, for your neighbors, and for your neighbors. Um, may they know who Jesus is this week. May they encounter him like they maybe haven't encountered him in a while. May he begin to become more plausible, more tangible through you and through me. And may they recognize that the kingdom of God has come to them.